Well, good morning and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. It's good to see you again here on the Sunday morning as we gather uh, to worship on the first Sunday of 2021. We come to worship. We come to worship the one who has come and will come again, the one who holds this world and our lives in his hand. And as we come into worship, I invite you to stand for a responsive call to worship this morning based on the words of the prophet Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The dawn of God's grace, the dawn of God's faithfulness is here with us again this morning as we worship in his name and the light of the world has come who reveals God's glory. As we gather, receive God's blessing and welcome this morning. Grace to you and peace from God who is our Father and Christ who is our Redeemer and the Holy Spirit who is our Comforter all the days of our life. And together God's people say, Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord of our yesterdays, todays, and tomorrows, we gather here on this first Sunday of the new year in a mixture of, of fear and expectation. We do not know what the year ahead will hold for us, yet by faith we trust you. And we place every day of this year in your care, knowing that as in the past you are with us, caring for us with constant love. As we come together this morning to worship you, may your name be honored and may we dedicate our lives to your service through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. It is still the season of Christmas, so hark the herald angels sing. Join the song and worship this morning. Joy. 
as those who glory in the one who has come and hark with the heralds, the newborn king. We also worship him in faith. And uh, here at the first Sunday of the new year, it's good for us to profess this faith together. And let's do that as we use the words of the Apostles' Creed, these ancient words of faith. Together, the church today says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue our worship here on this first Sunday of 21, we do so with a couple prayer requests to share with you this morning. One of them, uh, two of them you know already, and the two are more recent. We want to pray for the family of Mel Woolley uh, this past Monday at uh, 95 and three quarters of a year of age. Uh, Mel Woolley completed his earthly journey and want to lift up the family and lift them up in prayer. A private uh, funeral service, uh, graveside service, uh, is planned for tomorrow at Mount Everest. And so let's lift up the Woolley family. On Friday afternoon, Ruth Boss, also a member of our church, Ruth Boss, uh, passed away uh, following a short illness with COVID-19, and uh, we want to lift up her family. Uh, Ruth never married, but she has many beautiful uh, nephews and nieces and dear friends, and we want to pray for them as well. Uh, funeral service, uh, the arrangements are pending, uh, but again, it will be a private family uh, gathering. So we want to lift up uh, the family of Ruth Boss. Continue to pray for Jim and Lisa Bosch in the passing of uh, Jim's stepfather, Tim Squires. Pray for Linda, Jim's mom, uh, in this time for comfort for them. You received uh, via email, if you received the prayer request that way, you know that Dean Troyer is at Bronson Hospital. Uh, he also tested positive for COVID-19, but the main uh, physical issue he's dealing with is some concerns over the health of his colon, and he's uh, considering some options for care, but for now is... Um, comfortable at Bronson Hospital and want to lift him up in prayer. He does ask, uh, he asks all of us for his prayers uh, as well. So these are some prayer requests. And of course, it's the beginning of a new year. And we want to pray for God's uh, steadfast love and his faithfulness to guide us and lead us in the year to come. And we do that by asking his blessing in prayer. And let's do that as we turn to God in prayer this morning. Please join me. Father in heaven, on this uh, first Sunday of 2021, it is a new year, and uh, we lift up our eyes to you, O oh God. We lift our eyes to you, the creator of heaven and earth, and we know, where does our help come from? Well, not from the hills, not from the mountains, not from Washington or Was Wall Street, not from anything but you, O oh God. You, who have promised to walk with us, you who walked with us last year, who will walk with us again this year. We trust, O oh God, that by grace you have created us for a life of intimacy with you. In that same grace, you have raised us to newness of life in Jesus. And now, as your beloved children, may we set our hope, may we set our purpose to walk with you in the days to come as we think and speak and do life with Jesus in this new year. We confess, Father, too often we resist your work in our hearts. You're committed to destroying all kinds of hostilities and reconciling all kinds of people uh, in our own families, in our friendships, in our churches, and in our communities. Forgive us for when we choose resentment over reconciliation. Forgive us for when we choose to nurse our grudges instead of building bridges. And forgive us for when we choose to rehearse our hurts quicker than we remember the gospel that says, forgive as we have been forgiven. So we pray for one another this morning. 
We pray for this community of faith and for our brothers and sisters around the world. We ask, O oh God, uh, for your comfort. Surround the family of Mel Woolley, and Tim Squires, and Ruth Boss. Lord, surround them with the uh, great awareness and knowledge that your presence is with them. And, and we are grateful, O oh God, for where your children stand uh, in your presence. We pray this morning, O oh God, for Dean Troyer, that you will sustain him and help, give him health again for each day for, uh, for the residents of Park Village Pines as they face a, a significant increase of, of COVID-19 cases in, in recent weeks. Father, we pray for our students, for our school staff as they return to school again tomorrow. Uh, we pray for those who are facing dark days due to depression or other mental health concerns. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our neighbors here in this community, for our neighbors around the world, O oh God. And a new year does not always feel new when it carries with it so much of the trouble and the pain of the last year. Father, we pray this morning for those who have not yet received Christ as Savior and Lord. For those here with us this morning, those who will put their you will put in their, our, us in their path, really, in this coming year. Uh, help us to uh, pray for the grace to do what you call us to do, to love those who are far from you, to love those who hurt us, to love those who, who drain us, to love those who may never acknowledge our kindness in return. God, in all things, help us to love deeply our children, our spouse, our neighbors, uh, strangers alike. We don't know what 2021 will hold, but we trust, O oh God, that you will stoke the flames of our compassion. Give us laser vision of Jesus, of the coming city of God that we may live in love to your glory. May, may the hope that we have, which is in you, Lord Jesus, may it compel us, may it give us courage to, to live by faith that we might love you and, and love our neighbor as fully as you have loved us and will love us for all eternity. As we bring our offering to you this morning, as we open our hearts to your word, may we reflect the work you've done in us uh, that we might be generous people this year and help us to walk by faith. And as we are nourished here at the table this morning as well, send us out uh, to bring glory to your name and a blessing to others. We ask this in Jesus' name, the very one who came to set us free that we might live for him. In Jesus' name, amen. I encourage you to check out our heritage happenings for any ministry updates uh, here in, in this church uh, and throughout our community as well. Uh, just a note, we are uh, celebrating communion this morning, and if you didn't pick up one of our communion cups on the way in, be sure to do that prior to our celebration of the Lord's Supper uh, later in the service this morning. Our offering and tithes continue to support the ministry of this congregation, and our kingdom initiative is for a phenomenal organization called Rehoboth Christian School. I think we have another slide for them as well. Rehoboth Christian School, they're located in Rehoboth, New Mexico, a school that aspires to be a light in the world by bringing hope and opportunity through life-changing Christian education. We have supported Rehoboth Christian School for many, many years, and uh, they've been a strong uh, outreach and ministry and branch of uh, the Christian Reformed Church, a denomination to which we belong, and we're grateful uh, to support them. So all of our loose change offering, and again, the offerings will be uh, accepted or received on the, at the doors on your way out. You'll find baskets uh, there uh, on the chairs. Well, it is the first Sunday of the new year, and we are returning to a sermon series on the book of Romans. We took a bit of a hiatus uh, for the Advent season, but this morning we are turning once again uh, to the book of Romans, this time to Romans chapter 7. You find that on page 1,182. What we have heard throughout the series is that Paul's one plea, and it's a huge plea, but his one request is that followers of Jesus Christ living in Rome, living under the shadow of this mighty great city, that those believers would be resilient in their faith in Jesus Christ. As he says in, in Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, 
of himself. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of those uh, who believe. And, and that's Paul's desire. And it's a great way, a reminder in a sense, to uh, begin our new year um, praying that we too would be resilient. And as we've made our way through the book of Romans, Paul has challenged the church then and the challenge today to say, this is what it looks like uh, to be resilient. If we believe that we are saved by faith, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, that calls us to be a particular kind of people, to make sure we don't go back to old patterns, for example. Well, picking up on where we were last time, was November 22 was when we uh, closed off the series for a bit. That was on Romans 6. In Romans 6, Paul says to the church, look, you understand grace, but grace does not mean your sin doesn't matter. Grace does not mean you can do whatever you want because, well, hey, God's grace will forgive me. It doesn't matter if I cheat or steal or lie or all these sort of things. No, he says, no, hold time out. Time out. You don't, you don't get to do as you please. You have been called in Christ to live for Christ. Well, now we're going to look at Romans 7 this morning, and, and I'll give you a heads up. You're going to be standing for a while because we're reading the entire chapter of Romans 7 this morning because it's one big unit and Paul is making one big point and that is if if it's true that grace doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want it's equally true that you have to be careful to think that it's what you do that keeps you in God's grace that what we do somehow certifies or makes concrete that God saves us by grace it's just as destructive to live as if it's up to us to remain justified, as if our justification is conditional. And I'll say heads up here, I'm not going to say a lot about this in the sermon, but this is prevalent in all of us. And Paul gets very personal, and he shares his own struggle in that too. Paul's going to explain to us why it's not true that we have to maintain justification, and then he shares from personal experience what happens what happens when we live as if our freedom in Christ depends on me or on you? That's what Romans 7 is about. Before we hear from God's Word, though, let's invite the Holy Spirit once again to be present as we open God's Word together. Please join me in prayer. Father of new mercies that are there for us every morning, meet us again as we come to be a people to be fed. And we need this nourishment. Feed us on your words that your Holy Spirit would use them to inspire us and motivate us and move us to embrace the wonders of our freedom in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, our passage is Romans 7. I invite you to stand if you're able and willing. Uh, if you feel like your knees may not hold up for the whole reading, feel free to sit down. But we're going to look at Romans 7 this morning, the entire chapter and a powerful piece of scripture in which Paul gets very personal, and you'll hear that in a moment. But listen to God's word as we find it here in Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, of course, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's released from that law, and she's not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law for the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. So when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, 
produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good. So that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, slave to the law of sin. This is God's word for you this morning. You may be seated once again. Part of me wants to tell you that if you are thoroughly confused by what you just heard, um, you are in good company. It's, it's a bit of a frightening thing approaching Scripture each week as a pastor to preach on it, but it's even more of a, a frightening reality when as I'm paging through several commentaries and, and I even talked with a colleague of mine this past week and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm preaching on Romans 7, and he said, oh... And when the, when the commentaries say, this is probably one of the most difficult passages because you could write 10 books on it, but you get to do it in 20 minutes. Well, we're going to look at Romans 7 this morning, and here's the question that is going to frame what we're going to do. What does a believer's freedom in Christ look like? What does a believer's freedom in Christ look like? Paul reminds us, Back just in Romans 6, what I mentioned at the start, your freedom in Christ does not mean you get to live any way you like. Why does God keep telling us we shouldn't lie and shouldn't steal and, and that marriage is between a man and a woman and, and that you should honor authority? And Why does he keep doing that? Because there are still a law at work in the Christian life, but there's a different relationship now. The problem with Romans 6 or the problem that Paul raises in Romans 6 is and you have to understand that when, when you're free in Christ, that doesn't mean you get to do what you want. You are, now, um, you are now an instrument of righteousness. That's a phrase that Paul uses in Romans 6. You are now an instrument of righteousness. That's how your heart, your feet, your lips, all of it should move toward. Not what is evil, but what is good. Sadly, that's a hard thing. Sadly, it's a hard thing for us to do, but... We have been set free, Paul says. So why, why celebrate sin? Why revel in it? Why live in it? Why do any of that? Well, now we get to Romans 7, and Paul, again, is addressing what I raised earlier. There's sort of an, an equally dangerous posture when it comes to our freedom in Christ, and it's the idea that I raised earlier that our justified status, and Paul has made this clear throughout this book, our status is in Christ. We're justified by Him. 
God propitiates, He removes His wrath and applies to us Jesus' righteousness. That's all of our freedom in Christ. The danger is, and uh, I say this personally because I know it myself, Paul says it personally here, the danger is saying, well, I'm free, but I've got to maintain it. I've got to work hard to make sure that I stay free as if my freedom is dependent on me. Now, sadly, this exists far more than most of us realize, but it's the idea that Christ did his part, and now I'm going to do my part. Now, why does that happen? Well, there's probably many reasons, but the one I want to raise this morning is the sense in which we struggle with assurance of our salvation. That's not an uncommon question amongst the lives of believers. How can I be sure that I'm sure that I'm sure? How can I know that I know that I know? And the challenge is that we want something tangible. And what isn't more tangible than a list? What isn't a better way to keep track of my assurance than to say, well, here's my list of things that I've done, and I'm going to check them off, and this way I can know, I can be sure that I'm still free in Christ. Have I done enough good? Have I loved my neighbor enough? Have I served others enough? Have I confessed and repented of my sin sufficiently? Now, please understand, it's not bad to be self-examining yourself. Scripture calls us repeatedly to be people of, of confession. The danger of, that Paul raises here, it's the danger of self-determined assurance versus Christ-determined assurance. And self-determined assurance is fraught with so much danger, and chief among them is what Paul says here in Romans 7. If we're determined to maintain our justification, we are no longer living under grace, we are now living under law, and we're standing on the wrong ground. In effect, I have to keep the law. So the law now has a certain function, and by the law I mean more than God's Ten Commandments, though not less than it, but all of God's will. If I'm living under law and no longer under grace, the law is functioning in a different way in my life than it ought to be. Now, here's another side of it, by the way. It's not only bad mojo to do this, but you and I now evaluate others on the same basis. So we'll say, well, that person only went to church once in the last month. Or that person didn't, uh, didn't help their neighbor last week. Or you see how we do this judgment-based righteousness. And that's just as dangerous for them as it is for our soul. So Paul is saying, look, self-determined assurance, bad idea. And Paul tackles that here in Romans 7. He begins in the first section, verses 1 through 6, with a simple yet beautiful illustration saying that your freedom in Christ means you are not under the law in, a, in the bad kind of way. We're still under law in the sense of what it calls us to obedience in Jesus. That's a different function. But we're not under law as a self-righteous or self-assurance plan. And to make his point, he talks about marriage. Now, I'll say this about Paul's illustration. I'm not alone when I say this. It's, it's not a sure-proof illustration. It's a good illustration. It's not a great illustration. Let's not read too much into the illustration. But it does make its one point. And the one point is this. In the same way that death ends a marriage... Right? Till death do we part, right? End, a death ends a permanence of marriage. Paul says that's exactly what happens in the Christian life. When, when you died to sin and came alive to Christ, which is your conversion, which is the uh, born again reality that John, Jesus talks about in, in John chapter 3, when, when you move from under law to under grace, the self assurance strategy, which only bears the fruit of death, Paul talks about that here. That plan, it's gone. You don't have to live there anymore. You died to that. And the good news of the gospel, Paul says, you've been released from the self-assurance plan. I know it's hard because we like tangible things and we like these lists to say, well, you know, I did A, B, C, D, and E, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I got to feel better than somebody who didn't. And Paul says, don't go there. You do not obey you don't do the things, and if you, if we all struggle with this, by the way, you don't do things in order to secure yourself. You do them because of gratitude, the third part of the Heidelberg Catechism, all about this. Guilt, grace, gratitude, right? It's all about, I'm so thankful for grace that I'm going now 
keep God's law. That's the second function. That's a different function of the law in the Christian life. Paul says here in verse 4, we obey because we are saved to bear fruit for God or to God because we belong to Him who was raised from the dead. There's Paul's first point, verses 1 to 6. Look, people of God, understand you're no longer under law but under grace. You died to sin. You're alive to Christ. So don't be tempted into that. And then he says, now I need you to know a little bit about how the law functions, however. Right? He's affirmed throughout the letter that we're saved by grace through faith, but he wants us to understand that we still struggle with sin, and that's the function that the law has for us. In the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer two, or Lord's Day two, I believe, it says, uh, how do you know that you're lost in sin? God's law tells me. Well, the God's law also has effect in the third section of the catechism. It says, how do you know how to live a grateful life? Well, God's law says that too. And here in verses 7 to 13, Paul is going to explain for us how the law now works for you and for me if we're in Christ, if we're under grace. He asks a question. I think he's anticipating the question uh, in verse uh, 7. Is the law sin? No, he says. We are the sinners, not the law. He says in verse 12, the law is holy. And then he talks about, he brings up the example of the 10th commandment, which is you shall not covet. And he says of the 10th commandment, that commandment is holy, righteous, and good. All of this is Paul simply saying to you and I, as if we're trying to be resilient followers of Jesus in our world today, and we need to know how to live for that, well, we need, we need God's law. We need to understand how that works in our hearts. It's, it's holy. It's perfect. It's good. It's right. We need it. We need it, as he goes on to say here, because... It exposes how we fall short. God's law works to expose our sin. In the same way that keeping the law will never keep us justified, the law also works to show us how we fall short. It exposes our sin. Pick any one of the commandments. Paul happens to pick the 10th commandment. You shall not covet. I, it's wonderful. Uh, we know that he was raised probably as a lawyer by trade as well, but um, he was a masterful mind, and he went for the commandment that we all probably think we keep the best. You shall not covet. And the reason we think we can keep it best is there's no tangible way of proving otherwise. In other words, this is a heart commandment. This is a heart commandment. External obedience isn't enough to keep it. But when you really look at the 10th commandment, and I know I, I tend to talk about the Heidelberg Catechism a lot, but if you go to the Heidelberg Catechism, what it says about the 10th commandment, it goes right to the heart of the issue. It's game over for us if we really consider what the 10th commandment says because it exposes what's going on in here. By extension, uh, Jesus has the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, Jesus takes the law, he says, look, unless you, uh, unless you keep every single one of them, you'll never be right with God. And what's he saying there? He's pushing the law back inside. And so Jesus raises things like adultery. And people say, well, I haven't cheated on my spouse. But Jesus says, oh, no, no. If, if you've even lusted with your eyes, then you have committed the commandment, broken the commandment in your heart. Or he says, you're guilty of murder if you hold anger in your heart towards somebody. And call them a fool, raka, says Jesus. Or you're, or you're guilty of lying. I'm just going to pick a couple of examples in the Sermon on the Mount here. But Jesus says you're guilty of lying if your yes is not yes and your no is not no in your heart. Or you're guilty of stealing when your heart serves two masters. Wonderful passage, Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. He's talking about the heart issue there. All of this to say what Paul is saying here in Romans the law exposes our sin. I mean, really, here. It activates in us. It's like, um, uh, it's like an x-ray machine, some have said, right? It, it reveals, it exposes, it, it activates in us an awareness of our sin, as Paul says, that we might see that every sin is utterly sinful, every one of them. It exposes how determined we are to break God's law. I read a lot of stories this week, but... I, it reminded me of um, the time I, when I was a kid. I remember this clearly. We went on a, a, a school trip 
to Stanley Park, which is one of the big parks uh, in uh, uh, Vancouver. And uh, they had painted the benches in the park. And I think you already know where this is going, right? Big sign on it said, do not touch. Anybody want to guess what I did? What is that, right? The law says do it, and what did I do? <laughs> right? Why does that happen? Because it, it exposes something in me. And that's what Paul is saying here in this passage. Look, you want to touch the sign. It's not something that's just been painted wet. Why? Because you've got this sinful nature, and the law reveals it. The law is not dead to you, even though you've died to it. We need the law, as Paul says, because it's holy and it's good and it's right. And we need to hear God's will because it exposes how we fall short. We can't, we'll never be resilient as followers of Jesus until we understand the way the law works. So that we'll get to where Paul does at the end of this passage. But he doesn't get there quite yet. He's now talked about it explaining how the law works, and now he gets very personal in verses 14 to 25. Paul tells you his story. If you read this passage over again, verses 14 to 25, I, I want you to read it just looking at it through the heart of Paul. Paul who says, look what this little law does in my life. Paul who, we hold him up, we esteem him as one of the greatest missionaries, greatest theologians, greatest follower of Jesus. And here he is God honest about it. He says, the law is spiritual, I am not. And I have this conflict in me. Someone put it well like this, the, the law is holy, but it cannot make us holy. The law is just, but it can never justify us. The law is good, but it cannot make us good. And that, that's what Paul is saying here. He says, the law is holy, it's for my good. But the things I know I want to do, I don't do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, and he says, I know I shouldn't do, I, I do them. It's just this terrible war going on inside him. And people of God, this is, this is my story. This is your story. It's me in middle school putting my finger on a wet paint. We're all there. Think about the Ten Commandments. We'll limit ourselves just for a moment to that. We've lied this week. We've coveted this week, even though we know we shouldn't have done any of it. That's Paul here in this passage. I know the good I'm supposed to do. I'm not doing it. I know the law is good for me, but I'm struggling with it. I'm, I, I have the desire to do the good thing, but I end up doing the wrong thing. And, and I long to please God, but I can't do it, at least not in my own strength. That's, that's this rather confusing passage in a nutshell. Paul's just saying, this war is at war in me. The law reveals my sin. And Paul is honest and he shows how our sinful nature works. Again, we know what we ought to do, but we don't do it. And the wrong we shouldn't do, that's what we end up doing. And that is what leads Paul to a beautiful moment in verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death. And let's just stop there for a minute. That is the prayer of a heart that is honest with God about how hard it can be to live in our world today under so much intense pressure to conform to it, to do things the way the world does it, to live in ways the world approves, and celebrates, and exalts. This is a prayer, a heartfelt prayer of you and me when we're depending on the Holy Spirit. God, Help me, I cannot do it on my own. And the great answer is the one Paul gives. Thanks be to God. How am I going to do it? It's going to be through Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's a big deal. Thanks be to God, says Paul. My life is under, when my life was under the law, I didn't have any freedom. My life is now under grace. I have freedom, but I'm wrestling with it. But my security, right? This is not the self-determined assurance plan. My assurance, Paul says, is Christ. Christ. Yes, I struggle with my sinful nature. I'll never take hold of the way life should be in this world. I know that. But that's why I also struggle with the assurance of my salvation some days. That's Paul. That's me. 
That's you. This is why we need Christ. It's the beginning of a new year. It's first Sunday. We're three days in. Some of us are thinking, hey, it's not been so bad. Well, you wait and see. Didn't last year teach you us anything? Right? But this is why we need Christ, says Paul. Our, our justification secured in Jesus. Our sanctification led by Jesus. As we love to sing in an old hymn, and if we sang more songs in our morning service, we would have sung this one. It was uh, Matt Mayer uh, repurposed it, I want to say, an old hymn, and these are the words, right? I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. My one defense, this is the new updated version, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. I would love, I'll say this personally, I would love if that was the prayer we prayed more than anything this coming year. I believe great revival will come if we make that our prayer. God, I need you today. I can't do this on my own strength. I can't. I need you. Every hour I need you. Forgive me, Father, for thinking I can make an hour without you, even a minute. I need you every hour. You are my one defense. You are my righteousness. That's the prayer of a heart seeking Christ. It never stops saying the words, Jesus, I need you. I need you because my sinful nature confirms that I am not holy. I cannot be holy as you are holy, but that's the standard you call me to, to be holy as you are holy. Who can help me? Thanks be to God, there's Jesus. My only hope is in you. This, all of this, is how freedom in Christ works. Remember the question I started with? What does, for a believer... What does freedom in Christ look like? It is hands open that said, Jesus, I need you. I need you, I need you, I need you. A church that's going to be resilient, you as individual followers of Jesus who are facing, in, again, immense pressure to conform, we will not get anything nearly right until we make that our prayer. Jesus, I need you. Let's cling steadfastly to Christ. Let's sting, uh, cling hopefully and hopelessly even to Christ. Today is the first Sunday of a new year. I said somewhat tongue-in-cheek a moment ago, if 2020 has showed us one thing, it actually showed us many things, but one thing, it's that we will not get anywhere on our own wit, wisdom, and strength. It is for us to walk humbly in obedience and absolute dependence on Christ. That's it. I'm not going to give you a 12-step plan to success in 2021. I can't do that. I won't do it. There's no five-step plan to help having a better family, a stronger marriage, or a greater spiritual life. It's just one thing. Depend on Christ. All because our assurance comes not from what my hands can do or the list that I can check off. My assurance, because there's so much we must do, by the way, there's so much, loving neighbor, caring for the poor, lifting up the brokenhearted, right? Praying for our enemy. All, there's a lot of things we should do. But we are only going to get the strength to do it when we're relying on the one who is our strength from Christ. As we journey through grief, maybe a loss of a job, a breaking of a marriage, a wandering of a child, an economy that might tank, politics which... You know, I rarely bring that up here, but that's a little testy. How are we going to navigate it? People of God, it is only going to be as we depend on Christ. Not what our hands can do, but from the hands of Christ that have done so much. That were nailed to a cross. And now hold your hands and hold you too. It's in his name that Paul would say, let's bear the fruit that belongs to Christ as we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Let's do that. Let's serve in a new way of the Spirit as we depend hour by hour. A study came out back in the late fall already, but was brought back again just a few weeks ago. Uh, of course, through the Internet, you can track a lot of what people are searching for. And in 2020, there was a lot of searching of Scripture. In fact, astronomical numbers, and this passage from Isaiah 40, verse 41, verse 10, was the number one scripture verse 
that was found or searched out. And I think if you read it, you kind of get it, right? So do not fear, God says to the people of Isaiah, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Mark that one in your Bible. I know you don't, you don't have your personal Bible here. I wish you did. You'd grab a highlighter. and you. Right? Isaiah 41, verse 10. That's Paul in Romans 7. What a wretched person I am. Who will rescue me? It is Christ. It is Christ who will rescue me. And so then, therefore, depend on Him hour by hour, moment by moment. Run the race of being faithful to the one who has been and will be faithful, no matter what comes in 2021. Struggle is real, but greater is the one who paid our debt. He, as we will eat in a moment, He is our blessed assurance. In Him, may we strive daily to walk in our freedom under grace that the world can know that we are bought with the precious blood of Christ. And as we conclude our service this morning, here, here in the death of Christ, I stand. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, God of all mercies that are endless for those who seek it, meet us again in this hour, meet us in the next hour and the hour after that, because we need you. Oh, we need you. Teach us, precious Savior, what it means to walk with you in the year to come, depending not on our devices, not on our wit, our wisdom, our strength, because that is nothing. Depending wholly and only on you, Jesus. Remind us again that we are a people under grace. And that calls us to posture ourselves in a new way to your law that exposes, yes, our sin, but calls us to a life of deep gratitude, thankfulness for all that Christ has done for us. Now as we gather here at this table, we come weary and worn out and needing to be fed, and you will feed us. We will walk out of here, I pray, O oh God, with the, with the power of your Spirit at work in us, living boldly for Christ. Teach us this, O oh God, by your grace, that we may bring joy to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, we live in a world that tempts us to fall in love with something new every day. This world that calls us and tempts us to conform to things that are not of Christ. But our hearts belong. They belong to Christ and they live best in His body. Nowhere do we see that more vividly than when we gather around the communion table. Here we remember the price that Jesus paid on his bo in His body and through His blood to make us his own. Here at the table, the Holy Spirit communicates and confirms God's grace and the forgiveness that is found through Jesus. As we gather here at this table, listen to the words spoken at the very first celebration of communion with Jesus and his disciples. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. With these words, Jesus commands all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup in true faith and in the confident hope of his return in glory. In the supper, God declares to us that our sins have been completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself finished on the cross. And as Jesus said a prayer before sharing this meal, let's do so again this morning. Please join me in prayer. With joy, we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth. You have made us in your image. You have kept covenant with us throughout 
every generation, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, who by his life, death, and resurrection has opened the way for us to everlasting life and also to a life of joyful obedience. Come now, Holy Spirit, so that our receiving of this bread and cup may be for us the receiving of Christ. Remind us of the breadth of your church. Remind us of the joy that it brings you when your people gather together in praise and service to you. And now joining our voices with all of Christ's church, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To you, Jesus says, come. Come, all you who are truly sorry for your sins, who believe in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, who have confessed his name and desire to live in obedience to him. Come eagerly and joyfully with assurance of faith. For Christ, our risen Lord, invites you as guests to fellowship with him at this table. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Go ahead and peel back the first layer of uh, your communion cup this morning and then join me in this liturgy. The body of Christ given for you Thanks be to God. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Please peel back the second layer of your cup. And then join me in this liturgy. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer once again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that is infinitely more than all we can ask or imagine. Thank you for your love, which brings us food from heaven, gives us the life of your dear Son, and assures us. It assures us that we belong. We belong to Christ. We belong to the great company of all his faithful people in heaven and on earth. Grant that strengthened by this fellowship and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would continue the work of living for Jesus in the year to come and to do so until we come to the glory of your eternal kingdom. We pray all of this through Jesus Christ, who is your Son and our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for God's blessing. A new year is here. We do not know what the year will hold. We hold this to be true. We have a blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. This is our story. And by the grace of God, as you leave this place, having been nourished by the assurance of Christ for you, receive God's blessing as you go from this place. To him who has loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Together, God's people say, Amen.